Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Kip. I'm an alcoholic. I ain't had a drink all day long either. I'm really confused. I, I can't believe a country could have such beautiful women could have such ugly men. Thank you guys for inviting me and welcoming me, and the hospitality that you've shown has just been phenomenal. Your country's beautiful, but too cold. I keep wanting to set something on fire, you know. <laughs> I figured out where all the trees went. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't remember you guys' names. So you say your name, and I go, uh huh. <laughs> you know, and then you. Everyone's name means something, you know, and I, that's cool. You know, I, I was wondering what my name meant one time, and I looked up in an old dictionary, and my name means something, too. It's an old English slang from the 12th century. It means a prostitute's bed. <laughs> <laughs> I always call it would be the lion-hearted or something like that, you know, but... Uh, that's not, that's not my story. <laughs> my father's Irish. And, and Sue, Lakota, from the Dakotas. And uh, my mother is uh, Irish and Chippewa from the Oklahoma territories. And uh, my, my father liked to drink. And my mother liked to fight. You know, and, and just to tell you a little bit of like what it was like, you know, in a very general way, we, we'd be waiting for the old man to come home. And it'd be getting later and later. My mom's getting madder and madder, you know. And, and we're just sitting there waiting. And uh, pretty soon you'd hear him bouncing off the curbs coming up the hill. And, and if you looked out the window right then, you'd see all the neighbors grabbing their lawn chairs and turning off their lights and running outside. They wanted to get a good seat. You know, and uh, and my mom would run outside as soon as he pulled in with a butcher knife to the the driver's door, and she he would dive through the passenger door, and then she'd be chasing him around the house, and and that was just Monday night, you know, it, it wasn't anything phenomenal, and you know I tell you that my father. That's not why I'm an alcoholic. My father taught me exactly what alcoholism and alcohol would do to a family and what it would do to a marriage, what it would do to children. I had no illusions about alcohol. I wanted nothing to do with it, <clears throat> nothing to do with it. You know, I lived in a neighborhood, and uh, it was all first-generation Hispanic Mexican, and nobody spoke English, and everybody had very dark skin and dark hair and dark brown eyes. And my, my cousins live with me, and my cousins have very dark skin, brown eyes, you know, and, and dark brown hair. And I was born with white hair and blue eyes and real white skin. And when I went inside of the house, the Mexicans wanted to kick my ass. And when I went in the house, the Indians wanted to kick my ass. You know, and, and I, I knew I was different right from the very beginning. I knew my case was just a little bit different. Me and my brother stood out like a sore thumb in that neighborhood, and, and we got real crazy. You know, um, I, I was never going to have nothing to do with alcohol. My, um, my dad totally disgusted me. He embarrassed me, and, and I didn't want nothing to do with him. You know, and, and I, I can't blame it on him, but I do blame it on um, the San Diego Unified School District because they had this great idea in the early 60s, that, that, that way they needed to teach the young people about this stuff that we don't talk about in A&A. &A. You know, and they took us into this big hall like this, you know, and they had some guy get up and talk, and they showed us this movie. And the lights came back on, and I, and I hit my friend Balto in, in, in the rib. I said, Balto, can you get some of that stuff? He goes, oh, yeah, my dad smokes that. 
And I said, well, get some, man. And, and so the next day I said, you get it? He goes, yeah. He says, meet me after school. And so I met him. And I said, so what do we do? He says, we got to go boost some wine. I go, wine? What for? He says, I don't know. But my dad always drinks wine with it, you know. And, and we didn't want to make any mistakes, <laughs> you know. So we went in this little store, and, and I boosted the short dog of port wine. And we went down this little canyon, and he fired up this cigarette. And he took a hit off of it, and he handed it to me. And I took a hit off of it. It made me cough. And I took that wine, I looked at it, and I pulled the cap off of it. I'd never had a drink in my life. And I tasted it. I took a pull on it, you know, and it, I swallowed it, and it just jumped right back out of me, you know. And uh, But I ain't no quitter, <laughs> you know. And, and I took another pull on it, you know, and I, I just held it down, and I had to pinch my nose, you know, because it kept kind of yo-yo, you know, go up and down and up and down. And after a while, it, it kind of settled, you know, and I started feeling this feeling, and I, and I took another drink, and it was getting easier and easier. And by the time I finished the bottle, it was just going smooth, you know. And I looked over at my friend Balto, and he's sitting down there, and he's smoking on this little cigarette, you know. And he had, I said, no, no. I said, but you're going to drink that? He goes, oh, God, that stuff's horrible. I said, can I have it? He says, knock yourself out. And I, I drank his bottle. And uh, it was a beautiful, sunny, warm day, and, and I was, I leaned back on this bank, and there's beautiful clouds going by, and I leaned back, and... I had my head in my hands, and I was looking at the sky. And I experienced my very first spiritual awakening. You know, I don't know what alcohol did for any of you. But at that moment, something happened inside of me. It just clicked. And it was the very first time in my life that my skin fit. And I realized for the first time that I wasn't afraid of anything because I'd been living in terror and absolute fear all my life. And it was the first time I noticed I was comfortable, you know. And I knew a lot about the first three steps of Alcoholics Anonymous a long time before I met any of you people or heard of your program. Because when I was 12 years old, I, I knew that I was powerless over this world. And I knew that my life was unmanageable. And I drank this amazing elixir. And I came to believe in a power greater than all of you. You know, and I immediately, with no reservation, turned my will and life over to it, and I never looked back. You know, two years later, I got kicked out of school in the seventh grade for hitting a teacher for the second time. And they said that I was antisocial. <clears throat> he was a jerk, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and when I came home, I've been dabbling with this other stuff, too, and my mom was standing in the doorway. And she, when I walked in, she's just standing there, and she holds up this bag of this green vegetable matter. And she said, what's this? And I looked at her, and I said, it's dope. She said, get out of my house. I was 14 years old. It'll back up a little bit. I'll tell you a little bit about my mom. My mom, I love her to death. I take care of my mom today. And... uh but my mom is the meanest woman on the face of the earth. <laughs> I told you she likes to fight. You know, I, I watched her. St she stabbed my dad three different times. And the most impressive thing, when I was about 11, she was arguing with the neighbor about something. And he said something to her, and she picked up a shovel and knocked him cold, you know. <clears throat> and when my mom had a certain look on her eye, man. When she told you to do something, it was just, yes, ma'am. You know, you, she did not debate. And uh, she had that look, you know. She said, get out of my house. And I said, okay. You know, and I split, you know. And I, I lived in a little tiny town, and I'd never been anywhere, never done anything. And I went over to a friend of mine's place over in the next town, and he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. And he said, check this out. And he opened up the newspaper, and he said, look, all these people, man, all these young people, they're going up to San Francisco. And all they do there is they get high and listen to music and make love. I like music, you know. I like music a lot, you know. When I was 14, I really liked music, you know. I, all I thought about was music. And, uh, and I went up to this place called Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. 
1964, and they were right. They were right. There was lots of music there, and uh, and there was lots of everything there. And I just share in a real general way about that experience. You know, I didn't fit in there at all. I grow hair pretty good, but I like to fight. And these people were pacifists, and I just didn't quite get along with them. <laughs> there's not a day that goes by that I, I don't thank the God of my understanding that I'm not allergic to penicillin. You know, and that's all I'm going to say about that experience. You know? <laughs> I found out that what my true calling was that I was no hippie, that actually I'm a capitalist pig, you know, and um, I saw opportunity. I saw people that wanted this certain product, and they were all these square little white kids that come from the suburbs. You know, I know where this stuff comes from. All my friends come from Mexico. And I called Balto. I said, Balto, check this out. He said, no kidding. Come on down, you know, and me and little Balto, we put a little business together <clears throat> that I don't want to go into too much. but um, <laughs> And it worked out very well for a long time until I was 16 years old. And I, and I was arrested down in Mexico with 200 kilos of um, green vegetable matter. <laughs> <laughs> and I was sentenced to 25 years in prison in La Mesa Federal Penitentiary in Baja, California. <clears throat> Nice things don't happen to 16-year-old boys with long blonde hair and blue eyes in a prison. And it should have been, if anything in the world, that experience should have taught me, you know, that I really needed to change my direction. But in all actuality, it turned out to be one of the greatest career moves of my life because Balto was related to half the people in that prison. <laughs> and, uh, and most of those people were in the same business, and they were conducting their affairs out of there. And they realized that I was more valuable outside of the prison than inside of the prison. And I love Mexico. It's a lot like Louisiana in the United States. It works on the principle of it's called morida. And morida means the little bite. And what that means is, is if you can afford it, you can do anything if you know the right person who has the key. You know, and I like living someplace like that. You know, we found out who it was. We paid the people. I called my brother. I said, bring down $5,000. And he brought it down, and they let me out. And I continued doing what I was doing. You know, by the time I was 18, I was doing this in a real big way. And... Uh, on my 18th birthday at 5.30 in the morning, the police came in and they arrested me with 27 felonies, indictments. And I was living with a young lady, and she was pregnant. And, uh, and they didn't arrest her. They just came and took me. And, uh, and I fought that case. I had the money. I was in a county jail for a little over a year. And I had the money and I had lawyers in it, but it took almost a year for me to finally beat it. And I couldn't get in touch with that girl, and I was worried to find her. And she didn't write, and nobody would take my phone calls. And when I finally got out, I went to go try to find her, and her family had sent her to Texas. And they said, you know, you stay away from our family. And, and, and I never did get to find out what happened. Right after that, I, I met this other gal. And um, I used to do really stupid things sometimes, you know. Has anybody here ever gone to jail for being stupid in public? <laughs> Just doing the stupidest things for no reason, right in front of God and everybody, you know? And they, they used to lock me up on a regular basis, not for anything criminal, just doing something stupid, you know? And, uh, and this little girl I was running around with, she bailed me out of jail three times in one week. And the last time, she, she was only 15 years old, and I, and I said, how come you keep bailing me out of jail? And she looked at me with this real puzzled look, and she said, well, what else would I do? And I married her, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and me and that little girl, she was the great, greatest crime partner I've ever had in my life. <laughs> I've known Hell's Angels that didn't have as much balls as she did. She, she, she said, I'll try anything once, you know? And, uh, and we did. And we had a heck of a good time for a long time. I got busted again, and I went back to prison for another year. And I got back out, and uh, I was on parole. I knew I'd never make parole in California. So me and her, we moved up to a little town in Oregon. And while we were up there, she got pregnant. And uh, 
One day she said, come on, we got to go to the hospital to have the baby. And I drove her down to North Bend, Oregon. And I went and sat in this little hospital, you know, and she went in this room. And, and after a while, this doctor came out and he brought this little baby and he put this little baby in my arms. And I looked at this baby and something inside of me just exploded in my heart, you know. It was the very first time in my life I ever felt absolute, total, unconditional love for a human being. And I wasn't even expecting it. I didn't even know where it came from. And I experienced my second spiritual awakening, you know. And I looked at that little boy with more love than I've ever felt for anything in my life. And I said, you know what, you're never going to be afraid of nothing. I will protect you all the days of your life. You're going to be my pal. We're going to do all those things I always dreamed about doing with my father. And I meant it with everything I had. You know, I got off a of parole up and up there, and then we moved back down to California. And she got pregnant again, and we went to another hospital. And they came out, you know, and they put this little girl in my arms, and it was exactly the same thing. My heart just exploded, and I fell in love, just fell madly in love with this little girl. You know, I'm an alcoholic. In the world I lived in, man, you had to learn how to think fast, and I learned how to think real, real fast. I think so fast. I'll be sitting at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous sometimes, and one of you pretty gals will walk in. I'll fall in love with you. We'll get married, have a couple of kids. You'll cheat on me with that old timer, and I hate your guts before you've got to your seat. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like that, you know, just... And I'm looking at this little baby, and I'm thinking, she's still wet. They have, you know, I'm going, someone's going to want to marry her. <laughs> okay, what, what's the conditions going to be? Where are we going to have the wedding? What am I going to wear? What are you know? That's where my mind works. I mean, I don't live in the now. I live way back then or way up there, you know. And, uh, and they said, give me the baby. We got to weigh the baby, you know. So I gave her the baby, you know. And, and, uh, but it was the same thing. I, you're my princess. You know, I'm going to give you everything. And you know what, I'll tell you, at that period of my life, alcohol, I could pick and choose when I wanted to drink. I was always very cautious, the business I was in. Every time I drank alcohol, something always happened. But I could pick and choose when I wanted to drink. And, uh, and for the next five years, my life was totally dedicated to my children. I had made a lot of money. I had a real nice place. And... and I bathed my children. I fed them almost every meal. I changed their diapers. I taught them how to walk. I taught them how to talk. And we played every day. That's all I did. My brother lived with me and my wife. And, and that was just us. We had this beautiful place. And, I, and I, it was the best part of my life until I came here. On September 6th, in 1976, my wife and daughter had gone. They went downtown to go get school clothes. School was getting ready to start. It was real hot that day. Me and my son were playing. A friend of mine came over and he brought the stuff to smoke and we smoked it and all it did was it made me real thirsty and I wanted some beer and I went in to get some beer and I didn't have any. And there was no one there to watch my son. You know, and I just wanted a drink and uh I just got on my bike because the store was down the street, you know, and I putted up to the store to get a six pack of beer and I got it and I came right back. And when I'm coming down the hill towards my house, the police were all in front of my house and the fire department and all the neighbors were running out of their house towards my house. And, and I didn't know what had happened. I thought there'd been a wreck or something. And I parked my bike and I waded through this crowd and I found out that my son had chased me out of the driveway and he'd been run over by a truck. And when I got to him, his head was split open, and I could see his brains. And his legs were broken, and his ribs were broken. Some of them were protruding. And a little piece of me died that day, you know. We we got him to a hospital, and, uh, and I sat in that hospital with him, in intensive care with him in a coma. And I don't know nothing about God, you know, but I started crying out to this God, whoever he was, you know, please give me back my son. I'll, I'll do anything in this world if you give me back my son. You know, and uh, every day I would talk to the doctors, and every day the doctors would tell me, pray that he dies, because there's so much brain damage. There's nothing whatsoever to hope for. 
and I wouldn't let go of him. You know, I would just sit there and I would, I'd move one muscle after another and go from the tip of his fingers to his toes, just kept exercising his body because he was just in a fetal position, and I didn't know what else to do, and I just kept working with him. And I did this for nine months, and I started getting real crazy, and I started drinking. And this was one of the very first times where I found out I started getting those looks at people where, when he was going to have to have an emergency surgery and I would show at the hospital drunk and the look of the doctors would give me a total disgust. You know, how can you be drunk like this at a time like this? You know, I got real used to that look after a while. My son survived. He made medical history, as a matter of fact. Uh, the little boy, the personality, the little boy I had was gone forever. I got back a little boy who couldn't hear and he couldn't talk, you know. He never emotionally or mentally got past the age of about four years old. And he had lots of physical and lots of emotional and lots of mental problems all of his life. And the guilt of that was so intense. I, I, I really started drinking. Because drinking took away the guilt. It took away... That picture of him laying there, that picture was burned into my brain. And I couldn't go to sleep at night, and I started drinking more, and I started drinking more. You know, after a while in the business I was in, I wasn't making no money. Nobody trusted me with nothing. You know, my brother lived with me all my life. My brother Bill, we were only 11 months apart. And he was the closest human being I've ever been to. And my brother came down with a disease called schizophrenia. And the family, when my son was at the hospital, my family had had him put in a mental institution, and he called me one day, and he said, Kip, get me out of here. I said, are you okay? He says, yeah, they're giving me these pills. Just get me out of here. Do whatever you got to do. Get me out of here. You know, and, and it wouldn't have mattered where he was. You know, I, I went and got him. I got a lawyer, and, you know, and I went against the doctors, and I went against the family and everyone, and I got my brother out of there, and I brought him back home with me. And my son was in a special hospital, and I needed to make some money real fast. And I, I put this thing together. <clears throat> I told my brother, I said, Bill, I'm going to be gone for three days. I want you to watch the kids. You know, keep an eye on everything for me. And he started crying. I've never seen my brother cry. He said, you can't go, man. Something's wrong with me. I don't know what's going on. And I said, you know what, just hang tight. I'll be back in three days. And I gave him a handful of money because money's fixed everything all my life. You know, and he just looked at me, you know, and I got in this cab and they took me away. And, I, and this thing I was doing, instead of three days, it turned into three weeks. And when I came back, my little girl, Jana, I said, Jana, where, where's your uncle? She goes, I haven't seen him since you left. And I go, you're kidding me. And we had a little, he had a mobile home right across. He lived on my property, but I had a creek that runs through it. And he lived on the other side of the creek. And we went over there, and I opened the door to my brother's trailer, you know. And my brother, the third day, had blown his head off, completely off his shoulders. And when I opened the door, his head rolled down to the foot of my feet. And there was just a big pile of maggots laying there in that doorway. And a great big piece of me died. You know, I don't tell you any of this, except that I like to drive one point home. There's a part in the book in Chapter 5. It's read at every meeting, and a lot of people don't understand what it means, you know. But it said, there's those among us who got here with grave emotional and mental illness, you know, and that's who I am. And I'll tell you this, that when my brother's head hit my feet, my very psyche, my whole, my very soul completely snapped like a branch breaking. And I'll tell you this from my heart to yours, that I thank God I'm an alcoholic. I thank God that alcohol does for me what it does for me. Because if it wouldn't have been for alcohol, I would have blown my brains out. You know. But alcohol took away the pain. It took away the guilt. It took those pictures out of my brain. You know, when I first came here and I heard you people read the promises, I thought you were talking about alcohol. But those promises did everything. They fulfilled those promises. Every time I drank, it took away all that fear. It took everything away. Everything was okay. I could lay down at night. I could close my eyes. And when I drank, when I got up, the screaming would start. And I could function in this world one day at a time. Not real well, but I didn't want to blow my brains out. You know. And things in my life started falling apart real quick. You know, um, my wife, God bless her, 
Kathy, she's a, she's a wonderful member of Alcoholics Anonymous today. She's been sober for 14 years now. But she, you know, there was a guy that was paying more attention to her. I wasn't paying any attention to her pain. She was in as much pain as I was, but I'm totally self-centered. I can, nobody hurts like me, you know. And, uh, oh, you relate to that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> you might be dying of cancer, you know, but I got a hangnail. <laughs> And I'm not paying no attention. This other man was, and she left with him, you know. And I don't blame her a bit. And, and the only thing that was just left was me and my little girl, and she was five years old. In the first five years of her life, man, it, it had just been Disneyland. And she loved her brother. She loved my uncle. She loved her mother, and she watched everybody leave, you know, or die. She was with me when I found my brother, you know. And she was on the couch, and we were sitting there, and she was crying and shaking. And I said, what's the matter? She goes, Daddy, I'm so scared. What's going on? Everything's, everyone's dying. Everyone's leaving. And I said, honey, I said, we don't need nobody. I said, you know, we just hit a bump in the road. And, I, and I'm going to get it together here in a little bit. And don't worry about a thing. I'm going to take care of it. And then I had a knock on the door. And I've been informed that you don't have this particular product here, and that's really too bad. It's the one thing that I always suggest for a newcomer who hasn't quite made that decision. <laughs> Is anyone here for their first meeting? Anyone here for their last? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, if you ever have any doubts Go to California and order a bottle of Mad Dog 2020. Mad Dog 2020 is, it should be classified as a class A narcotic, I think, you know. But it's very cheap and it's very, very strong. And I'd never heard of it. And he brought this stuff in and I drank this stuff. And the next thing I know, someone is tapping me on the shoulder. And they're saying, excuse me, sir, you have to get off the plane. I was in my living room the last time I checked, you know. And I open my eyes and I'm on this big wide body jet and it's completely empty. Except for my little girl who's sound asleep leaning next to me, you know. And I go, where am I? And she goes, you're in Fort Lauderdale. I said, Florida? And she goes, yeah. I said, I hate Fort Lauderdale. She goes, I don't know nothing about that. you got to get off the airplane, sir. So I haven't got a clue, but, you know, I don't want to look stupid in front of my daughter. So I kind of straightened up, and I said, I woke her up hoping she's going to throw me a bone, you know. I said, wake up. And she woke up, and she looked at me, and I'm hoping she's going to tell me something. She looked out the window, and she said, are we there? I went, Yeah. She got, well, let's go. And I, and I walked off the airplane. I'm not a clue. I noticed I had some money. and called a cab from the airport. I said, take me to a hotel, but stop at a liquor store because I need to figure out what's happened here. <laughs> you know, and the next thing I know, I opened my eyes, and um, I'm completely naked, and I'm in four-point restraints on this table. And for just a second, I thought I might have missed something really cool, you know? <laughs> and, uh... <clears throat> I found out what had happened. It was a misunderstanding. I'm sure you all relate to that. <laughs> but uh, I, I was drinking tequila. And I'd met this young couple, and they had this local Floridian additive. And you could really drink a lot with this additive. And we drank the tequila, and then I, I asked them if they'd ever heard of Mad Dog 2020. And they hadn't, so I went and I got a bottle of Mad Dog 2020. And, and apparently, from what I was told... At about 3 o'clock in the morning, I was down in the lobby of this very nice hotel, completely naked, trying to introduce myself to this young woman. 
in Southern California, that's not a really big deal, you know. But in Florida, they're very conservative. <laughs> and they called the police, and uh, the police didn't know what to make of me, so they took me to mental health, gave me the big geese of Thorazine, you know, and knocked me down, tied me up. And... Um, I'm talking to this doctor, and I'm telling him, I'm going, you know what, this has been a mistake. You know, I've been through a lot of trauma. Um, if you let me out of here, I give you my word. I'll be out of your state before the sun sets. And the guy says, be gone, you know, and I, he didn't know what to do. And, I, and I, I don't know where my daughter is. I haven't got a clue. And you can't say nothing because they could call the police, you know. And I don't deal with the police at any level, at any time, for any reason. <laughs> and I... I'm hoping I got some matchbooks or something in my clothes maybe that I can track her down, but I know I'll figure it out. And as I'm walking out of the hospital, this young couple comes walking up with my little girl. And my little girl, she runs up to me, and I said, come on, baby, we're getting out of Florida. I told you this place sucks. You know, and, uh, and I'd love to tell you that that was it, you know, that that was the end. But that was only the beginning. That was only the beginning. For the next three years, me and my daughter lived like animals. I drugged that little girl. We lived through five different states all through the South, and every place we lived, I promised her it would be different. I'm going to get you in school. You know, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to do this. Everything's going to be okay. And I would do exactly the same thing over and over and over ad infinitum. In every place we lived, I left at a dead run at midnight, you know. And the last place was in Oklahoma City. And I managed to stay sober for one whole week, and I'd gotten a job, and I'd got a little place for us to live, you know, and I, I was trying not to drink, and we got paid, and this guy says, come on, we'll go cash our checks, and I'll buy you a beer. And I came in late that night, and my little girl, we didn't have a TV or radio or nothing, but she was sitting on that couch, and she, you know, she's seven and a half years old now. And she looked up at me. And she just dropped her eyes, and she went over, and she picked up her pillow, and she grabbed her raggedy old doll, and she stood by the door. And I grabbed a few things, and I said, come on, we're getting out of here. You know, and we got on this bus, and I had enough money to get another bottle of wine. I got a bottle of wine. We got on that bus. I said, we're going back to California. And uh, I passed out on that bus, and I woke up the next morning, and I was so sick. And I needed a drink, and, I, and my little girl was just sitting there. She was rocking back and forth, holding her stomach, and she was crying. And I said, what's the matter? She goes, Daddy, I'm so hungry. And I said, as soon as we stop, I'm going to get you something to eat. And uh, we pulled into this little place, and, and I went into this liquor store, and I grabbed her a little sandwich, and I got me a bottle of wine, and I got up to go pay for it. And I only had enough money for one or the other, and I had to put her sandwich back. And I got back on that bus, and, uh, and she saw that bottle and that bag. And I just walked past her. And I couldn't look at her. I just sat behind her. And there was this elderly black woman on the bus, and she had been watching this whole thing. And she was just a saint, man, because she never said one word to me. But she said to my little girl, she said, hey, honey, she goes, my daughter made me this big lunch. And I hate to ride alone. Would you come and sit with me and help me eat this? And, uh, and she took care of my little girl all the way back to California. And I just sat back and nursed my bottle of wine. You know, I, I've done a lot of things in my life. I do a lot of things that I would never, ever share from the podium. But I've never in my life done anything that shamed me more than that moment. It shames me to tell you about it. But I want to express how powerful alcoholism was for me. I got back, you know, and I did what all heroes do at the end of the road. I went to mom's house. <laughs> My mom hadn't heard nothing from us since we left. She didn't know if we were dead or alive. My daughter is the only granddaughter my mother has. She thought the sun rose and set on her. And she opened her door and she saw her granddaughter there with long stringy hair and a dirty face and this dirty dress holding on to this raggedy old doll. She looked at me with a hate I've never seen her give my father. And she grabbed my little girl and pulled her in the house and she put her finger on my chest. She goes, you get off my property. If you ever come back here, I'll kill you. And she wasn't joking. 
you know. And I just left. And, you know, I thank God for my mother because she saved my daughter's life, I'm sure. The next three years, I don't know. It's I, I know from where I got sober, people have told me. I've got police records that I've checked on. And I have brief periods of memory things, but for the next three years, I drank wine. I lived in a, on the Pacific Ocean on this cliff in Carlsbad, California. And there was a little restaurant on top of this cliff and their septic tank drained into this big bamboo patch right into the center of it. And it smelled real bad and it was dark and nobody would go in there. But that was my home, you know, because it, it looked and smelled just like the inside of my head. And I was safe in there because the cops wouldn't even go in there, you know. And there was a little 7-Eleven, a little convenience store right across the road. And I could go there and I could panhandle for wine. And I would get my wine and I'd go back to my bush and I would drink. And when I came to, I'd go back to my... And that's what I did for the next three years. I know that I was arrested in front of that store 52 times for drunk in public. I know that I was in county mental health 17 times for, for going absolutely insane in the middle of an intersection and just starting to scream at things. I know that... I remember this one a little bit. I was panhandling, and the guy says, you like to drink? And I said, yeah. And he went over to his trunk of his car, and he opened it up, and he had a gallon bottle with white label with these letters that said vodka. <laughs> Nothing else, you know. And he said, here. And I drank it. And it was real hot that day. It was like 110 degrees Santa Ana condition. And I decided to get a suntan. <laughs> you know what? Do you ever sunburn your tongue and the roof of your mouth? <laughs> and your armpit, you know, third degree burns? I remember that one, you know. And I lived like an animal and I was an animal. I drank, I drank to the point that I lost the ability to talk. Because even the winos avoided me. Nobody wanted to talk to me. You know, and that's when it's really, when you see the other winos shuffling down the street and you're walking with a full bottle and they cross the street. <laughs> you know? You've hit a bottom. <laughs> I was standing in front of this 7-Eleven and I was so sick. I was shaking real bad and I needed a drink. I needed a drink so bad, I knew I was going to go into a seizure at any moment if I couldn't get one. And I had 65 cents, and a pint of wine cost 89 cents, and I can't get anyone to give me a penny. You know, and I was just standing there shaking, and I was just getting scared and scared and scared. And uh, this man pulled up, and he pulled up, and he's wearing a suit, his short hair. And he had this square little wife sitting in the front of the car, and he had these square little kids sitting in the back, you know, and... I looked at him with total contempt, you know, wondering how he could live like that. But, <laughs> and he looked at me, and he, and he got out, and he walked over, and he smiled, and he opened up his wallet, and he gave me two $1 bills. And I didn't even say thank you. I took his money, and I ran in that store, and I got a quart of wine and a short dog. And I ran outside, and I pulled that bottle up, and I, and I just drank that pint of wine almost straight down and leaned my face against that glass until the shaking started to stop and I opened my eyes and I saw that family sitting in that car and I could see their reflection in the glass and they were looking at me and they were talking. And I knew they were talking about me and I turned around and I flipped them off and cursed them and wandered back to my bush. You know, I'm here to talk about religion because it has absolutely no business in Alcoholics Anonymous. But that was a good people and they were on the way to a temple to worship the God of their understanding that day and they weren't talking about it. Those people are very good friends of mine today. And they were praying for this poor animal they saw standing there. And I went down this bush, and I'm opening my wine, and I'm taking a pull on this jug, and all of a sudden I had one of those weird, weird experiences 
where out of the blue I hear this voice in my ears going, maybe you ought to go to A&A. &A. <laughs> so I've been to A&A. &A. You know, I've been to A&A &A and them nut houses and them detoxes and they would hospitals and every once in a while some 90-day wonder would come down to the beach to try to save my soul, you know. <laughs> And I'd hustle him out of enough money for a drink, you know. You know, and I would patiently explain to these people that I'm not an alcoholic. <laughs> no, really. I'm a drug addict. I just can't afford any drugs. <laughs> no. <laughs> they did the same thing. You know, they laughed. They said, well, if you ever find yourself drinking when you don't want to be drinking, you know, come to Alcoholics Anonymous and we will love you till you can love yourself. <laughs> okay. I don't know what happened. I don't remember the journey or anything or even the decision. But my, neck, if my whole life for years was just moments of coming to here, you know. You ever come to at twilight? And you don't know if it's getting lighter or darker. <laughs> so you just kind of sit down and wait before you make your next move, you know? <laughs> that was my life. <laughs> I'm standing in this room at the back, just like this room. I'm standing there, and all these people are looking at me. And this guy says, are you looking for AA? And I nodded my head. And he said, would you like to identify yourself? I've lost the ability to talk. I try. I have absolute epiphanies in my brain. But when I try to open my mouth and say something, the only thing that comes out is, ah! It just gets stuck, you know? And it was great for panhandling. <laughs> But the guy looked at me, and everyone looked at me with a little bit of alarm, and they said, welcome, have a seat, you know. <laughs> I sat next to this pretty little lady, and she scooted all the way down. And I'm looking at these people. They look like you, man. These people are clean. They got short hair. They smell good. They're smiling and laughing. They're all looking at me. I've been wearing the same clothes for three years. My hair comes down past my ass. My beard comes down past my belt buckle. I weigh about 120 pounds. I'm covered in wine sores, and a whole bunch of stuff lives on me besides me. <laughs> and I was told I had a quite a fragrance, you know. <laughs> and I'm sitting there waiting for these people to start loving me. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm feeling like I don't fit in one more time. <laughs> and they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them, and then they start talking, and I hear what they're talking. They're talking about God. I'm going, oh, no. And then they start passing this basket. Uh-huh. They're going to start singing in a minute. <laughs> i got to get out of here, man. i got to. This is just too lame for me. Man. Uh, and I stood up. I'm going to go get a drink. And there was this lady, elderly lady, that had been looking at me for the minute I walked in the room. She kept trying to, you know. I thought she was just some brain-damaged old gal, you know. <laughs> and there was some guy talking about something or another. I don't know what. But when I stood up to walk out, she jumped to her feet, and she saved my life. She looked right at me, and she wasn't talking to anyone else in that room. Because no one of those people, they weren't even going to try to stop me. In fact, a lot of them were looking forward to me leaving. <laughs> they were opening the windows, you know. <laughs> she walked, she looked right at me. She goes, I walked in these rooms 27 years ago in Long Beach, California. She goes, a cop brought me here. He told me to go in there. He was tired of arresting me. Those people might help. And I walked in that room, and the meeting had already started, and I turned around, and I, I looked at all these people, and they were all squares. You know, and I knew it, and they were, I thought they were ladies in there. 
And I knew when those women turned around and saw me and saw what I was, they wouldn't want me around their men. She goes, I've been on the streets of Los Angeles since I was 14 years old and done everything a woman ever had to do to survive out there. And when I saw you people, I felt dirty. And I just wanted to leave. But a woman grabbed hold of me and brought me into the rooms and got me a cup of coffee and told me something. She whispered in my ear. She said, don't go nowhere, honey. We need you. And this woman started talking about 27 years of continuous sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous, about the women who grabbed hold of her and taught her how to be a woman, about a home group that grabbed hold of her and helped her get a job and helped her build a life, of 27 years of continuous sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous. And she walked over to, in front of all those people who didn't know what to make of me, and she grabbed hold of me. And this woman, she's a tiny little thing, she reached up and pulled me down and kissed me right on the mouth. The bravest woman I have ever met in my life. <laughs> you know? I mean, nobody had touched me with anything but a stick for about three years, you know? And this woman, and she's holding on to me, and she's hugging me, you know? And I tell you, people have been beating on me since the day I've been born. And nobody in this world has ever made me cry about nothing. I don't show no feel. I don't give nothing up. And this old gal, she's holding on to me, and, and she whispers up in my ear. And she says this. She goes, she goes, baby, she goes, don't go nowhere. We need you desperately. Please don't leave. And she said that to me. And my stomach started rumbling. And my eyes started getting wet. And pretty soon I'm standing there. And I am just sobbing for the first time in my life. I've never cried that hard in my life. And I'm holding on to this little old woman. And she's telling me it's going to be okay. And I started coming to a and &A. And you all lied to me right from the beginning. <laughs> Because there was a lot of what we were talking about earlier, a lot of middle-of-the-road AA going on. And they would say, well, just don't drink and go to meetings. <laughs> Anyone understand the term start raving sober? Yeah. I would not drink and go to meetings for about two days, and I would go absolutely insane, and I would have to drink. And, you know, and they said, you need to get a sponsor. I said, what's a sponsor? And they explained what a sponsor was, and I went, no. I've been on parole half my life, man. You know, I'm not a... I'm not a I'm not about to turn my life over to one of these lops, you know. I'll figure it out, you know. And, I, and they said, well, you've got to take these steps. And I'm looking at these steps and powerless. I've been carrying a gun since I was 14 years old. I ain't never been powerless, you know. Maybe a little unmanageable. I could relate to that. But I kind of like it that way, you know. I hate knowing what's going to happen next. <laughs> We talked about, you know, this insanity stuff. I don't know nothing about that. I know th that I was under psychiatric treatment when I was 11 years old for attempted murder on someone. And if you've always been insane, what are you going to be restored to? So I got real confused on that, and I just skipped over it. And then I got to the God stuff. Don't need none of that. I've asked God for help many times, man. He don't like me. He likes the people who love in the suburbs. Something about me just pisses him off, you know. He has nothing coming, and neither do I, and that's fine. And we got to this next deal, and I said, what's this? He says, well, you got to make an inventory. you got to write down everything you've ever done and share it with another human being. Now, prior to my absolute alcoholic life, I was a very successful career criminal. And I really prided myself in not as any paper trail of my activities. And now this member of the PTA is wanting me to write everything down and share it with him. I'm not about to do that, you know. <laughs> and then I'm going to this other one, and I'm going, wait a minute, what's, what does an amends mean? He goes, well, you got to go face everybody you've ever met and right the wrong. I go, what do you mean right the wrong? He goes, you got to fix it. And I go, I'm thinking, I'm going, oh, boy. I have this vision of going, hey, Loopy. Hey, man, it's Kip. Hey, brother, wait a minute. I I'm sorry I shot you and your brother and your dog. and took all your dope. But 
I'm in a spiritual manner of living today. <laughs> and I'm here to make things right. <laughs> Loopy would have shot me coming up the driveway, you know. <laughs> it might be okay for you people from the suburbs that stole a candy bar or something, you know. <laughs> but I'll guarantee you, there's a place in the United States I can't go back until all their kinfolk are dead, you know. <clears throat> I couldn't do these things, you know, but I wanted what you had, and I came to meetings. I came to meetings every single day that I wasn't locked up, that I've walked in these meetings. I've thrown up on your floors. I've pissed on your floors. I've passed out on your floors. I've stolen all the money out of the basket so many times I couldn't even tell you. And you know what? I chased your women, not very successfully at all, I will admit. <laughs> but, uh, and you know what they would tell me everywhere I went? Keep coming back. What a bunch of losers, you know? I wanted them to kick me out, you know? They won't kick you out. <laughs> See, if you just kick me out and tell me you couldn't help me, I can just go on my way and just drink. But you put all this stuff in my head, you know? And, and it was crazy. And I lived this way for six years. I'm still living in this bush for six years. Every once in a while, I start to get it together just a little bit, and someone would let me move in their garage or something. And as soon as I would, you know, get cleaned up just a little bit, and I'd get $5 in my pocket, and I had it all together again, you know. And uh, I'm busy, man. I'd like to go to a meeting with you tonight, but i got to do something, you know. And, and, and I'd be off and running again. And this was over and over and over and over and over and after six years, a lot of people stop sticking their hand out to you when you're doing that. There was one guy, and he came here and spoke here a couple of years ago, a guy named Cliff R. Cliff R. was a member of this group, and Cliff R. was one of the men that saved my life. Because every time I came, when all those other people, they didn't want nothing to do with me, Cliff would wade through the people, you know, and he would grab me and welcome me to the rooms. People like that brought me back. I come to in, a, in jail, in the rubber room, hogtied, cops had beat me down one more time. My face was, I was hogtied, my face had been bleeding, and it was stuck to this mat, and I'm trying to roll over and peel my face off this mat. And it was on Christmas morning, and I knew that Santa Claus wasn't coming that day, you know. And they let me out. And they said, just go on your way, Kip, you know. And, and I don't know where it came from, but I had $90, and I made a conscious decision that day I ain't never going back to AA. You know, I'm that person they talk about. I can't get sober. I can't do this deal. I can't humiliate myself in front of you anymore. I went and spent $90. I don't know where it came from. I think they might have made a mistake. But I spent every penny of it on Gallo Port wine, and it's one of the most beautiful sights. It took me two trips to get it to my little hooch. You know, and I started drinking, you know, because alcohol is the only thing that's never lied. Alcohol is the only thing that's ever taken away the pain, the terror, the loneliness. It's the only thing in this world that works for me. And I started drinking, you know, and on January 6th, my world collapsed. It talks about it in the book. It says there'll come a time where you cannot imagine life with alcohol or without it. And if you've been coming to AA for a long time and AA don't work for you, and the day that alcohol stops working, you'll know loneliness and terror as few human beings can even imagine. You know, everyone here, we all come from different places, different life experience and everything. But there's one thing that we have in common, and that's understanding what that word loneliness means. We know what it smells like, feels like, and tastes like better than any human being in the whole world. I do believe we almost have a monopoly on it, you know? And at that moment, I was the loneliest and the most terrified human being on the face of the earth, and I couldn't even imagine, I couldn't even imagine life without Karoka, without nothing to cut the pain, because it wouldn't work, it wouldn't do it. And I pulled out my gun and I put it to my chest and I pulled the trigger and I blew my left lung and two ribs out and knocked me all the way on this wall. And I'm sliding down this wall and blood's flying everywhere. You know, and the only thought I think is, thank God this nightmare is over with. Let me out of here. 
And I come through in this hospital. You thought I died, didn't you? Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Only I, for me to drink is to die. I go, only if you're lucky, you know. I come to, there was this old man in Alcoholics Anonymous. I hated his guts. You know, he, he always wore wingtips and a suit and a tie, and he always had this big, ugly blue book, and he said, I'm a grateful alcoholic, you know. And I'm going, oh. Every time he said it, I wanted to throw up on his wingtips, you know. And, uh, and he came up to me one time. He'd been sober in AA so long, he said when he got here, they only had one A in it, you know. And he came up to me, and he got right dead in my face. He's a great big man, and he looked at me and he says, you think you're pretty tough, don't you, kid? And I looked him right in the eye and gave him my best jailhouse look. I said, I'm tough enough, old man, don't you ever doubt that. He got this big grin, and he put his nose right almost on mine, and he looked me right in the eye and he said, you ain't tough. He says, you're the scaredest son of a bitch in this room. And that might make you dangerous, but it don't make you tough. And he walked away laughing at me, you know. <laughs> I avoided that man like the plague, you know. <laughs> I'd go to a meeting. Before I'd go in, I'd walk around and look in all the windows to make sure he wasn't in there, you know. And I, and I come to, I've been in a coma for about a week, and I'm opening my eyes. I hear this voice, and Charlie had this deep, gravelly voice, and I'm listening. To, I'm, no. <laughs> oh, no. And I open my eyes. And there's Charlie standing at the foot of my bed, and he's got these two newcomers, and they're looking at me, and their eyes are as big as saucers. And I know I've died, I've gone to hell, and this is it. <laughs> Forever! And I'm chained to this thing, and I can't get a drink, and this guy's going to preach to me through eternity, you know? And I'm looking at him, and Charlie looked at me, and I've never seen him look at me that way. He looked at me with a love, and a compassion I'd never seen on his face. And he put his arms around these two young men. And he said, take a look, fellas. Take a look. Pay close attention. Because this is what happens to an alcoholic who refuses to take the steps. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I got out of that hospital after about four months. I did an awful lot of damage to myself that I'm still paying for. You know, um, alcohol didn't work. Nothing worked. I just wanted to die every day. Now, May 12th was not much different than any other day. I come to, and the first conscious thought is I need to get something in my body as fast as I can. Maybe it'll work today. Maybe it'll take away the pain. Maybe it'll take away. Maybe it'll work. And at the same time, I've been to so many of these meetings that you people had poisoned my mind because what I'm hearing at 5.30 in the morning when I need a drink is the ABCs right at the end of Chapter 5, that I'm an alcoholic and my life's unmanageable. And I know I'm an alcoholic. I have paperwork really official-looking paperwork from the state of California classifying me as a chronic alcoholic. I am not in denial about me being an alcoholic, you know. But that's not what it's about. What it's about is in my innermost self here. What does that mean? What does that mean that I'm powerless over alcohol? And I had this vision. God gave me this moment of clarity. And I felt that day my daughter was born. And I felt that love, and I remembered it crystal clear, and I knew that I would give my life for my daughter without a hesitation. In the next vision, I was watching this man walk past her on that bus with a bottle of wine. And it suddenly dawned on me that alcohol owns me, lock, stock, and barrel. Alcohol is my absolute total master. It tells me what I can do, where I can go, where I can sleep, how far I can go, when I have to get up, when I have to lay down. And there's no room for another human being anywhere in this world unless they're buying me a drink. And the love that I have for my daughter, that she's just absolute human survival, one of the most strongest feelings a human being can have, can be canceled out for just one more drink. I said that my life's unmanageable, and I remember when she was born, what kind of father I dreamed that I wanted to be to this little girl, and I saw the way I'd run my life, how unmanageable, what a mess I've made of everything. 
And I came to the next part that said that no human power was ever going to fix me. I kept hoping you people were going to fix me. I kept hoping I was going to run into some pretty little girl and she was going to fix me. And there were some that tried, and if they hear this, you should have talked to your sponsor about it, you know. Um, and then I got to that part I've been dodging, man, dodging since I got here, that God stuff. You know, I got a resentment against God. God's the one that put me in that insane asylum I grew up in. The things I've seen people do in this world and the things I've had to do in this world, if there was a God, he certainly has a perverse sense of humor. I want nothing to do with your God. He never cut me any slack. But I started thinking, and there were some people around here I've been watching, and there's people I saw that had what I wanted, and it wasn't their money, it wasn't their women, it wasn't their stuff. It was a look in their eye and the way they walked through life one day at a time with dignity and purpose. And all these people talked about something. They talked about a power that did for them what they couldn't do for themselves. And I got down on my knees that morning, and it was the most sincere moment of my life, and I said this prayer that hasn't changed much from this day to that. I said, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what you are, and I sure hope it doesn't make any difference. But from this day forward, I will do anything. I will do anything that you put in front of me if I don't have to drink. And if you're not there, I'm screwed. And I do not have the vocabulary, but I do know that I am one of the really blessed people because something happened. Something happened that I wasn't expecting, and I don't have the vocabulary to tell you what happened. But I know that all of a sudden my spirit became very calm. Everything got real quiet inside, and I had a knowing I had a knowing in my brain that I knew that I wasn't going to have to drink if I could hold on to that. And there wasn't a shadow of a doubt about it. And I got over to Charlie's house as quick as I could, you know. And I knocked on his door, and his wife, a member of Al-Anon for 40-some years, she opened the door. We called her St. Edie. And she knocked on the door, and, I, and she opened it, and she goes, Oh, Chip! Oh, Charlie's going to be so excited! And then she goes, you know, you're his favorite. <laughs> and I went, really? <laughs> she goes, why don't you go around the porch and Charlie will be out in a minute. I found out later she told everybody that, you know. <laughs> Nobody ever needed to hear it more than I did, though. And I went back out there and Charlie came out and he looked at me and he smiled and he just sat down beside me. He said, how are you, Kip? And I said, I don't know. He goes, how can I help you? I said, Charlie, I don't want to drink no more. He goes, yeah, you've been saying that for a while. What are you willing to do? I said, anything. He says, I'm going to ask you one question. Are you done? I said, Charlie, from the bottom of my heart, I'm going to tell you, I don't know nothing about God. I know you do. And I pray to your God that I'm done. He goes, that's a pretty good answer. He says, Kip, he says, I got some good news and I got some bad news for you. He says, the bad news is people like you don't get sober. You die in institutions. You die on the side of the road. You are a very badly damaged human being. I don't know what the damage is, but you have a lot of problems. And people like you die. But it's also, I've been here for a long time, and I see the magic in your eye. I see the sparkle, and I know that God has opened the window for you. And this is the way it's going to have to be for you one day at a time, all the days of your life. One simple fact that absolutely nothing, no woman, no job, no child, no nothing in this world can ever become more important than you doing the things that you must do to maintain your sobriety. And that's a lot, lot more than just going to meetings. He goes, are you willing to do that? I said, I'll do anything you tell me to do. He says, come with me. It was on Mother's Day. And there was a park across his house, and there was all these families out there having picnics with their mothers, and they were all dressed up and nice. And I come walking back there, and that old man walked right in the middle of them, and he dropped on his knees. And I'm looking at him. I go, what are you doing? He goes, we're going to pray. I said, here? He goes, here. He says, I'm going to tell you something, Kip. The only hope you got is that God will grant his grace on you. Don't ever, ever be ashamed of him. He said, besides that, these people have been stepping over you for years. You're on your knees. You're halfway to your feet, boy. You know? And I got down on my eating, and that old man, he took my hand, and he taught me the third-step prayer. 
And then he said, come on. And he took me back and he had a little room that he detoxed the men that he worked with. And he called all the men that he sponsored. And they came over and those men took turns with me, sitting with me. And they'd tell me their stories. And they would, he came out and he detoxed me because I couldn't just stop. And he gave me, he, he got a half pint of whiskey and orange juice and caro syrup and he'd give me a shot and he just kept cutting it down. And after five days, I stopped shaking. And he said, okay, this is a program of action. And I'm going, yeah. I said, so what do we do? And he said the magic words. I've always thought they should have made a bumper sticker. The words that changed my life. He said, get in the car. <laughs> I said, okay, Charlie, I didn't tell you, but Charlie was an old gangster, and he'd had his right eye shot out when he was young, and he had a glass eye there. And, uh, and Charlie had this big old Cadillac, and he lived right off Interstate 5. He said, I said, where are we going? He goes, we're going to County Detox. I said, I'm detoxed. He goes, I know. We're going to go talk to the drunks. I go, what am I going to talk about? He says, you're going to talk about being sober for five days. I went, okay. And, and Charlie, when you're new with Charlie, Charlie would never stop talking because he didn't want you to have a thought. You know? <laughs> and he had to look at you constantly. He had to look at you right in the face, and he'd be driving. And we got on Interstate 5, which you have no idea if you've never been there. That's a huge freeway. And in, in the freeways, they got these little dots on the road. They put them there for Charlie. <laughs> but Charlie would put his front tires on those little left, and we'd be going down the road, and he's looking at you, and he's talking to you, and we're going. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> and by the time you got to San Diego, you knew this man had a relationship with God. <laughs> you know. And he took me into this detox, and these guys are laying on mats, and they came in. And Charlie said a few things, and he says, I want to introduce you to my friend Kip. He's got five days sobriety. He says, tell him how you feel, Kip. And I sat there, and I didn't know what to say, but I just, I just talked. I talked to other drunks, you know. And when we walked out, he goes, how do you feel? I went, that felt good. He goes, that's it. Hang on to it. That's the magic. You have to give this away. It's the only way you're going to get it. And he took me back, and he's laid out a course of action. He says, okay, here's what you're going to do. You're going to get a haircut. You're going to get a shave. I'm going to give you some money. You're going to go to a thrift store, get some clean clothes. You're going to get a job. I said, a job? I don't know how to do anything. He goes, God will take care of that. Don't worry. You know? And he said, I want you to get an identification in your real name. Oh, oh I've never done that before. <laughs> And I went and got an ed I did all these things. And, and he said, you're going to be at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous every single night. You will get there an hour early. You'll wait for the people to show up. You'll help them set up. You'll shake hands with every man that walks in there. You will not hug the women. Leave them alone. <laughs> you will not borrow cigarettes from people. You will not borrow money from people. You will beg them. You don't tell them anything about you unless they ask. And when the meeting's over, you'll help them clean it up. And you'll do whatever you can possibly do to get in there and be a part of that. And you'll do this every night. I said, for 90 days? He goes, 90 days? I go, you know, 90 and 90. He goes, none of that applies to you. <laughs> you know? He goes, you, I said, how long? I got to do it. He goes, until you like it. And I said, okay. So I go to him and he says, you're going to have a commitment at a men's meeting, at a book study, at a step study, and you're going to be at another meeting every single night of this week. And you're going to get a job, and you're going to go to work every single day, and you're going to pay your bills on time as the money comes in. You know, and I got paid, my first check was $150. And I said, Charlie, they're going to take all my money. He goes, no, they're not going to take any of your money. They're just going to take theirs. Uh, oh, that's how it works. <laughs> and he started teaching me how to do things that I didn't know how to do. And he taught me the, the word that changed my life the most important word an alcoholic in new recovery ever learns. And it's a word called commitment. Commitment. It means something different to us in here than it does to the people out there. Because the word commitment will save your life. I don't know about you all, but I ran out of excuses the day before I got here for anything. I was done. My, my bag was empty of excuses. He says, when you give us your word, you're going to do something. There's only one excuse for not doing it, and that is you died on the way there. <laughs> Period. Nothing to talk about. 
And he said, you're going to make a commitment. You're going to hold this job for a year. You're going to be at a meeting. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. Blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay. And I started doing it. You know what? And things started happening very slowly. This man took me through those steps, man. He set me down in that room. And he helped me do my fourth step. Because I could hardly write. My brain was so addled. It was so addled, he would help me even write it. He sat there and he worked with me and he worked with me. And we did that fifth step. And he made out that list of my defects of character that have been said, I've just been stumbling over all of my life. And, you know, and he made me this other list of the opposite of those defects. And he told me to start practicing those and stop practicing that. You know, we made a list of people that I could harm. And thank God he told me I didn't have to make any amends to any drug dealers. You know, he goes, if you give them back their money, they'll just sell dope to God's kids. So leave those people alone. They took their chances. But he says, everyone else you got to make an amends to. You know, one of the hardest amends I ever made, the hardest amends I made to anybody in my life was to my little girl. And I, I, was, I, I was scared. I loved that little girl with all my life. Everything I had, I loved that girl. And the regret and the guilt and the pain was so intense, I couldn't even look at her at two years sober. She was still living with my mother. And I went over to talk to her, and I said, Honey, I said, I'm trying to get my life together, and, and I need to do this. This is one of the steps, and I have to make amends with you. I have to make things right. And she just hugged me, and she said, Daddy, don't worry about it. You're sober. You're living good. That's all I ever wanted, Daddy. It's okay. You don't owe me an amends. I go, No, honey, that ain't enough. I said, Because I don't know how bad I hurt you. I don't know when I hurt you. I don't know the fears you had, how many times I embarrassed you, how many times I humiliated you, how many times you were scared. If you're going to forgive me for all that, you need to go do an inventory yourself, and you need to write that all down, and then we need to come back and talk, and you need to tell me everything that I've done, because I don't know. And we did that, and it took eight hours. And it was the most painful thing I've ever done in my life. But you know what it did? It changed my relationship with my daughter. And when she saw that I was willing to walk through that, our relationship changed. There was a couple of times we laughed. Most of the time it was a lot of tears. And three different times she jumped up and slapped me as hard as she could right in the face. And we spent that whole day going through that. You know what? And we started healing. You know, he got me busy in service right at the very beginning. My, my sponsor said this is, of course, a, a vigorous action. And I'd say, well, you know what I feel? He says, I don't care how you feel. I want to know what you're doing. Keep busy. And that man kept me busy every single day for the next three years. I met a woman. I fell in love. She got sober on the same day I did, and she liked to fish. So it had to have been God's will, you know. <laughs> and I didn't tell my sponsor about it, but we got married. And boy, was he pissed. <laughs> I don't ever do that, you know, and I, but, you know, she was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and she was as active as I was, you know, and, and it worked out okay for a long, long time, because after the next nine years, I had arrived, man, I had the big house in California, I had the boats, I had the new trucks, I got 18 people working for me. I just got through traveling around the world. I'm sponsoring all of San Diego, you know. I, I'm the director of everything. I'm the secretary of this. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. You know, I've got men in my house doing steps every single night, you know. And I'm busy. And uh, at three years sober, I needed to back up just a little bit. You know, at three years sober, the state of California gave me my driver's license back, and I got my contractor's license. And I came home, and I had a little house, and I just gotten married. And the phone rang, and I picked it up. And this little girl, she said, is your name Kip Collins? I said, yeah. She goes, do you know so-and-so? I said, a long time ago. She goes, that's my mother, and you're my father. And I've been looking for you. And that little girl that was born so many years ago back there, she came into my life. And she brought me three grandchildren, you know, three little, two little girls and a little boy. And, uh, and I got to make amends to her family, and I got to bring her welcome in and let her meet her brothers and sisters, and we became a family, you know, and I fell in love with her. And we built a relationship over the next few years with those children and her, and I loved her. And I just got back from a trip from Australia, and I was looking at my house and, you know, at my, my life. I just I'm, was sitting there thinking, how can you come from there to here? That's impossible. 
And I opened up the front page of the paper, and there's a story about a man who the day before, when I was gone, had broken into this woman's house and raped her all night long in front of her children. And when he was done with her, he took a knife and cut her to pieces. And it was my daughter. You people don't know me, but I'll tell you straight up, I'm perfectly capable of first-degree murder with no problem if you touch any of my children, you know. And I am absolutely insane. He did not kill my daughter, but she lost her face, she lost her right arm, and she lost her breast. And I went to that hospital, and I saw this lump of humanity laying there that didn't even look human. And I wanted revenge. I wanted revenge more than anything in this world. And the cops had got this man, but he ain't beyond me. You know, I'll get him. And I can't talk about it, and I'm nuts, and I'm crazy, and I didn't even go to a meeting, man, because I can't let this out, and I can't sleep, and I'm nuts, and I'm crazy, and I'm reading that book, or the sponsor said the answer's in that book, and I'm reading that book, and if there's anyone here that's got a resentment, they can't get rid of I have read it letter by letter. There are no loopholes. It says that that is the dubious luxury of normal people. For an alcoholic, it will kill us. It will cut us off in the sunlight of the spirit. We'll become insane again, and we'll have to drink, and if we drink, we'll have to die. You know, I read the, the book, and I remembered he said that nothing could be more important, and I'm looking on that book, and I found a thing. He said that if i got a resentment I can't get rid of, that i got to get on my knees and pray for that animal to have everything out of life I want. And the hardest thing I've ever done in my life since I landed on your planet, you know, was to get on my knees and pray for that animal. But I did it, and I did it every day. And I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I have totally forgiven that man. But I will tell you this, that I turned him over to God, you know. And that he's God's business and the law's business. He ain't none of my business, you know. And the insanity went away, and I was able to go talk to the men in my group, and I was able to start crying about it and feeling emotion. And I was able, and I had the means to go take care of my daughter and my grandchildren to get them the medical and the psychological help that they needed. And I was their grandfather and their father, because that's what they needed. And she needed me the most in her life as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. Her father was there and willing and able to do what needed to be done, what I could do. And you know what? It worked because I didn't have to hurt nobody and I didn't have to drink. You know, right after that, they told me I had cancer and they're going to cut off my lips. I like my lips. I'm really attached to them. <laughs> you know? And I went to see this doctor and, and he said, well, we're going to do this story. It's going to be very, very, very painful. We're gonna, you're going to have to take it. He says, are you allergic to anything? I said, lead. And anything that affects me from the neck up. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I cannot take any narcotics or anything for any reason whatsoever. And he goes, you could never go through this without it. I said, then I'd rather die of the cancer. You know, and he said, and I talked him into it. We did this surgery, and they cut my lip. I had a great plastic surgeon. They cut almost two inches out of here all the way down to here and then put everything back together. And I did it with absolutely... No dignity whatsoever. <laughs> I cried and screamed like a little schoolgirl. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I know I'm long-winded, but I want to tell you something. I rode for 22 hours on an airplane. I got stuck in an airport for 24 hours. So if I get a little bit loud, you want to hear the short version, you can come to California, you can take the ride. But I'm going to give you everything I got. <laughs> the men in Alcoholics Anonymous, my home group, Robber's Roost, those men stayed with me. They never let me out of their sight. They took turns. When a member of our group needs help, we're there. We're there 24-7, whatever they need. We're there. We don't leave their side. And I call for help, and they came. They came. And they took care of me. And these sick guys, they, these guys are real jerks, I'll tell you. <laughs> because my mouth was all sewed together, and they would try to come up with really good jokes to make me laugh. You know? <laughs> sick people. <laughs> I just love them. <laughs> you know, and I got through that, you know. And, and something had been going on with my wife. I don't know. We had a, she was the very first woman, the very first woman I'd ever experienced intimacy with. 
not sex, but intimacy of, of taking off all the armor and letting her see exactly who I was. And she didn't back up, you know, and, and I adored this woman. I just loved her. Her name was Connie, you know. And something had been going on, but I'd been trying to take care of my daughter and my cancer and my grandchildren. And, and, and I came home one day and she was sitting there and she was crying. I said, what's the matter? She says, sit down. I got to talk to you. And, and I sit down and she goes, Kip, she looked me in the eye and she was crying. She goes, I don't want to hurt you. I went, oh, please, then don't. <laughs> don't do anything you don't want to do. <laughs> she goes, Kip, she goes, I can't do this no more. I can't do this. It's a lie, and I'm going to drink. I can't do it. I don't want to hurt you, but I don't know what to do. I said, what are you talking about? She goes, Kip, she goes, I'm a lesbian. I'm in love with Chrissy, and I have to leave. <laughs> I didn't think she was going to tell me that. <laughs> Just, I went, what? <laughs> and I, you know, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. You know, you can shoot me, you can stab me, you set me on fire. I know how to handle that. Don't tell me you don't need me no more. <laughs> you know, it's like you just ripped my guts out and dropped them right on my new boots. Um, I, I react the way I always react when I don't know what to do with anger, you know. And I called her names and I cursed her and I, and I ran out of the house. And, you know, she was Catholic. And I joined the Catholic Church, and, and we had this great priest, Father. His name was Bill Wilson, by the way. <laughs> He's dead, so I'll break his anonymity. He was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous for almost 28 years. And we went to, I went to the church to get some advice. Actually, I wanted to rat her out, you know. And, and I go into his study with him, and I'm talking to him, and, he, and I'm telling him this sad woe, and he's sitting there looking at me. And I get done, and he says, so what do you think, Father? He goes, I think you make me sick. I go, what? He goes, you ever read that book you're always talking about? I go, what are you talking about? He says, you know, that one page, I believe it's uh, 61. <laughs> Remember that guy that thought he could rest satisfaction out of life if he did everything just right? He keep telling me what a wonderful husband you've been. You've done this for her, and you've done that for her, you know, and now she has done this. Was there a hook in everything you did? Was it done out of love or was it done out of think you had something coming from it? Uh, I don't understand. He goes, here's the reality. This was your wife. She made a vow to you. She kept her vow to you. Something changed in her. I don't know. That's between her and God. But you're not in charge of her sexuality. You know, that's her business and God's business. She was a good wife to you. She was faithful to you until it re it threatened her sobriety in her very life, and she loved you enough to come and tell you face to face. She didn't just do it behind your back. I said, yeah. He says, so go apologize. I'm going, yeah. He said, and give her her divorce and give her anything she wants. She's been a good wife to you. And I said, okay. And that's what I did, you know, and... And she kept my last name. She tells everybody she's my sister. <laughs> you know? And me and Connie, our relationship as a result of the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous got to change. And I love her with all my heart. She loves me. I'll guarantee you she loves me. Uh, she's with this woman. They've been together ever since. She comes and babysits my children sometimes. We... we we celebrate the same birthday, and we exchange cakes every year. And she, I did not have to throw that relationship out. It had just changed and evolved into something else. That's all. I didn't know you could do that. You know, I didn't know you could do that. And, and we did it. You know, and I got through that, and I didn't have to drink. I didn't have to hurt nothing, you know. And then I got attacked by this dog, and it almost tore my complete arm, arm completely off. And I'm in this ambulance, and blood is flying everywhere. And I call my guy, Scotty. He's this outlaw motorcycle guy. And he runs with all these sober bikers. And there's the only person I could think of to call. And I called him. I said, Scotty, I'm bleeding to death. I'm in an ambulance. They're taking me to a hospital. Meet me there. Don't let them put any narcotics in my body if I pass out. And we pulled under that hospital, and there's about 20 outlaw motorcycles there with all these guys in leather <laughs> screaming, Don't give that man any narcotics! <laughs> And those guys went into that hospital with me, man. And I, and I told the doctor, I said, this guy has total say-so over everything. 
and and they died. These guys never left me. They inspected everything that doctor did to them. They would not let them put anything in me that'll affect me from the neck up. You know, and I'm not telling anyone to do with your pain medication. That's your business. I don't care anything about it. See, you get loaded and drunk, my wife won't leave me. You know? I'm not real smart. I used up most of my brain cells on cheap wine. You know? The only thing I know absolutely with a certainty in granite is that no matter what I got to do to stay sober, it's easier to stay sober than to get sober again. That's all I know. I don't play no games with anything that goes in my body. You know, you know what? And I got through that, you know, but I couldn't work. And as a result of that, I lost my home. I lost everything. You know, right down, it was just me and my son and my dog. And uh, my son got sick. And I had to go sit in the hospital with him. I didn't tell you, but at the age of 23 years old, my son, see, I got involved with the men that had handicapped children, and they got me involved in the Special Olympics, and they got me involved in his school, and they taught me a lot of things about how to be a father to a handicapped child. And they got me through the guilt of it, you know, and, and, I, and I got really involved in this little boy's life. And, uh, and he graduated from high school at the age of 23 years old. And he couldn't talk, and he had a lot of mental problems. But he walked down that aisle in that black robe, and he gave me his diploma. You know, and he said, I love you, Daddy, in sign language. You know, and he was my, my dearest child. And, you know, and, and he got sick, and we had to go to a hospital. And I sat with that little boy for the next three months. And on October 4th of 1993, he died in my arms. And the promises, it tells us that we will know serenity. I want to tell you what serenity is to me. I don't know what it is to you. Serenity has nothing to do with standing and watching a beautiful sunset with a pocket full of money and a beautiful woman. It's a lot of fun, but it's not serenity. <laughs> serenity is having a relationship with the God of your understanding to a level that you're able to watch the person you love more than your own life and hurt more than you knew it was humanly possible to hurt. But at the exactly the same time, knowing without a shadow of a doubt in your heart of hearts that this was God's business and none of it was personal to you. It's just God's just life on life's terms. That's all. And I don't have to drink from it. It's just part of life. People are born. People die. Period. You know. And I knew a serenity and I got on my knees. And my sponsor came in, and we got on our knees, and we prayed. And I thanked God, and I thanked all you people of Alcoholics Anonymous who taught me to be the kind of father and to have the relationship with that little boy that I dreamed about the day he was born. And you guys gave that to me. I had thrown it all away. You know, that little girl that I had drug all over, she had gone to college, you know, and one day a man came and said, can I have your daughter's hand in marriage? I said, do you drink? He goes, nope. I said, you got a job? He goes, yep, I'm a pilot for American Airlines. I go, let me tell you something, pal. If you ever hit my daughter in anger, don't ever sleep in the same place twice. Got it? <laughs> he said, yes, sir. And uh, I went and got some credit cards, and I gave my daughter the wedding that I dreamed about the day she was there. They've been married for 11 years. I'm still paying. <laughs> I will have it paid off in the year 2012. <laughs> but you guys gave that to me. We got married in exactly the place I dreamed about the day she was born, right down on Torrey Pines in this beautiful building. And we walked her down, and, and I mean, I, my whole home group was there. And you ought to see all these outlaws in tuxedos and, and tattoos. It was absolutely insane. <laughs> Trying to act like gentlemen. <laughs> it was like a Godfather movie or something, you know. It, uh... <laughs> but everything was gone, you know, and it was just me. And I told my sponsor I didn't know what to do. And he said, well, why don't you go to school? You've always wanted to go to school because I'd only been to the seventh grade. He goes, you got no one to worry about no more, just you. 
So I said, okay. So, you know, I went down and I talked to this university and I found out what I wanted to do. They, I said, so what do I got to do? They go, well, it's going to take you about five years. I said, I can't do that. I'll give you about two and a half. She goes, well, you can't do it unless you do this. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And it was taking 24 units nonstop around the clock for two and a half years with no breaks. And I'm an alcohol. You know, anything worth doing is worth abusing, you know? <laughs> He says in that book, he says, we are extreme examples. Of, we are extreme examples of anything we set our minds to. It doesn't matter what it is, you know. And I started going to school, and I fell absolutely in love with education. And I graduated. I got that degree. And I was getting ready to graduate, and the, t the dean called me in, and she goes, you know, we have a problem. I said, what's that? She goes, we're not going to be able to give you your diploma. I said, why? She goes, we don't have your high school transcript. I said, that's easy to explain. I never went to high school. She goes, well, you can't graduate without that. I went, why not? She goes, because. <laughs> and she goes, I said, what do I do? She said, well, you got to go take the GED test, and I don't think you have enough time to do that. And I walked into this office, and I said, listen, i got to take this test today. She goes, we don't do it that way. You've got to study for six months. I said, no, this is what's going on. i got to take this test today. If I, what do you got to lose? If I pass it, I pass it. If I don't, I'll have to do it your way. She goes, okay, so I passed it. I got a 95 on it. <laughs> you know? And I graduated with a black hat and a gown and all that. And, and my home group came and watched me. <laughs> <laughs> and about this time, you know, I told my sponsor one day, I said, you know, man, I'm, I'm really lonely. I think I want a relationship. And he told me to stay away from women. So I healed up from that last one. And he goes, do you need one? I went, yeah. He goes, can't have it. So I'm going to give you the best advice I've ever given you. He says, it's absolutely impossible for an alcoholic to have a relationship if they need one. That's not a relationship. You can't have a woman until you don't need a woman to validate you as a man. When you get to that point, you can have a relationship, but not a minute before, because the worst will happen, you'll hurt yourself. I don't care about that, but you might hurt someone else. So you just, I said, well, can I date? He goes, keep it light. <laughs> and I kept it light, and I started going to work. I had, I was seduced. It was. <laughs> I'm only human. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I was sitting in my house one day. I just waxed my truck. Fed my dog. We had a big pot of beans going. I had some cornbread going. I'm just kicked back, man, my whole life. My little house is all together. And uh, I'm watching a ball game. And there was this young lady called me. And she said, Kip, she goes, you've been alone a long time. I said, yeah. She goes, I was thinking about that. She goes, how'd you like to come over and I'll cook you dinner and maybe we could mess around? I went, wow, I'm very flattered. I said, but you know, I got a big pot of beans going here. And I got cornbread and I'm, right, I'm watching this ball game. Maybe I could come over some other time. And she hung up on me, you know. And I went, oh, well. And, and I, I went, wow, that's what he was talking about. It's okay, you know. And I went, this is cool. And I said, God, this is, thank you. But if it be your will, after a while you learn how to negotiate. <laughs> but be careful. You got to say it just right. I said, if it be your will, I would love to experience true love one more time in my life. But if not, that's cool. <clears throat> Two weeks later, I was getting ready to, to go to work, and I got a phone call, and it was this girl who had seduced me. And uh, I think that's the way it happened. But anyway, she it was her mother, and I said, hi, how are you? And she goes, oh, we had a horrible accident. She got drunk last night, and she got in a car wreck, and she's got massive brain damage, and her body, she'll never get out of the hospital. I, oh, God, I'm sorry. Is there anything I can do to help? She said, yeah. Could you come up and pick up your daughter? I'm thinking, my daughter, what's my daughter doing up there? And she goes, you don't know, do you? I said, no, what? She goes, you have a three-month-old daughter. I'm 50 years old. I said, she goes, and I'm, I'm too old to raise any more kids. Do you want her? I went, okay. <laughs> and I got in my car, and I had to drive about 100 miles up to Burbank, California, and I knocked on this apartment door, and this lady opened the door. She said, hi, and she handed me a 
a diaper bag and a little bassinet and said, good luck, sailor, and shut the door. <laughs> I'm looking at this little girl, and she looked up at me, and she smiled. And my heart exploded. <laughs> and I fell head over heels in love, man. And God gave me... Ex- See, I was thinking of a blonde with a house <laughs> with credit cards, you know. I didn't know I have to change their diaper every hour. <laughs> But I'm absolutely convinced, it's been my experience to your women, that your love for me is very conditional about my behavior. I believe that the children that we have, man, and the people that I sponsor are the only unconditional love I ever experienced in my life. You know? And all the guys, some people say, well, you need to get a blood test. I'm going, "Uh uh-uh. God gave me this baby. I ain't giving it back. (laughs) You know? This is my baby. And, uh, and all the men, I, you know, I, I ain't got nothing for kids, so all these outlaws throw a baby shower for me. <laughs> and they're bringing little long-haired, bearded, crazy-looking guy with a little pink dress. <laughs> <sighs> and we had a party, and we served cake and punch, you know. Yeah. <laughs> And my life started filling up, man, and I, I'd rock, I'd put my baby to sleep, and I gave her her ba- bath at night, and I'd sing to her, you know. And the lady next door would take care of her while I went to work. And for the next year, it was just me and my baby girl, Natalie Marie, you know. And and one day, after about a year, I was at a meeting because she I would go to the, I couldn't get a babysitter, and I couldn't. She goes to meetings with me. Everybody knew her. And I was sitting at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous holding my little girl, and I. Uh, there was this lady that me and her have been on many committees together over the years. She's been sober as long as I have. And she looked over at me and she said, hi, kid. She goes, can I hold your baby? And I said, do you know how to hold a baby? <laughs> she said, give me that baby. You know? So I, I let her hold the baby, but I'm watching her, you know. And I'm looking at the way this woman is looking at my daughter. And I saw something in her I've never seen before, a certain different facet I'd never seen. I saw the look in her eye, and I saw my little girl looking at her. And I walked over after the meeting, and I said, so, Sabrina, how's John? This was her husband. She goes, oh, you didn't hear me? John got divorced two years ago. I said, oh, God, I'm so sorry. (laughs) I said, what happened if you don't ask? She goes, I wanted to have children, and he didn't. I said, do you like children? He goes, I wanted to be a mother all my life. I said, really? Sabrina is the love of my life. I have the greatest wife a man has ever had. She's my, she's my lover. She's my partner. Um, I dated her for six months like a gentleman, like I was taught to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I courted her, and uh, I proposed to her on my knee, and uh, she accepted, and we, we just celebrated eight years of of marriage, and we've never had a a real serious fight, you know. Sometimes I don't mind her, and she yells, but most of the time I follow directions pretty good, you know. (laughs) Seven years ago, we went to a hospital, and I delivered this little boy, white hair, blue eyes, and I cut the cord, and I named him Will. I call him God's Will until I got to know him. You know, (laughs) unfortunately, I got my seed back. He is my clone. You know, (laughs) he is my clone. And uh, I'm going to wind this up just right now, but I want to tell you, too, I've been, I've received so many gifts, I can't even tell you. I cannot even begin to tell you. One of the greatest things I've been given, and you'll never see it, no one will ever see it because. I get it at midnight when there ain't no one around to impress when my family's asleep and it's just me sitting there. It's okay inside here. There's no screaming. It's calm. It's peaceful. I never thought it could be that way. I want to share two little things with you before I leave. My little girl, I read to my, my daughter every night. I read her a story. I get up in the morning with my children and I make their breakfast. That's my job. I read my daughter a story, and I said, Natalie, I said, I'm going to be gone for a few days. I'm not going to be here to make you breakfast. I need you to be a big, good girl. 
she looks at me and she's just got, she's a singer and a dancer and, and she's got tears just, Daddy, I'm, I'm gonna miss you so much. <laughs> My heart's gonna be so sad. But dad, if you bring me back some jewelry, <laughs> it won't be so bad. <laughs> treasure. I said, baby, give me five. I said, that, that is going to get you stuff, girl. <laughs> Don't ever lose that line, you know. And, and she's the sunshine of my life. That little boy, my son, you know, he just won the award at school for the best student in the school. I went to talk to his teacher and they say, your son is the kind of kid the teachers pray for. I go, no, I'm Will's father. You know? She goes, you know, I don't know what your son's like at home, but when he's here, he's one of the most well-adjusted children we have here. He's very polite to everybody in this school. He follows directions. He raises his hands. He gets along well with all the other children. And I'm going, really? And they go, yeah. And I'm like, wow. You know, because this is the way he is at home. I come home, and I go, where's Will? And they go, he's down in the playground. And I go down to the playground. My son has long, he just cut his hair, but he had long white hair. And he's on this swing, and I can hear this screaming as I come around the corner, and he's butt naked. <laughs> and he's standing up on the swing, and the swing is just rocking, and he's screaming at the top of his lungs, You'll never take me alive! <laughs> <sighs> I don't want anyone to change Alcoholics Anonymous. I think he's going to need it, you know? <laughs> My message to you all is one simple thing. That the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is absolutely infallible. It will work for absolutely anybody, anywhere, under any circumstances. It doesn't matter what's going on. This works. It works every single time you work it. There are millions and millions of people that need this program, and it's not for any of them. There are millions more that want this more than anything in the world, and it's not for them either. It's only for the people that are willing to do the work. When we tell you, ask you if you're willing to go to any length, when you're new, you haven't even got the wildest imagination what that means. <laughs> you know, you haven't even got a clue. But don't get afraid. Come on in, man, and keep doing what we do until you can hear the music, you know. I want to thank you for my life and everything else you've given me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.